It's my pleasure to introduce you to our Invention to Impact the Wireside Chat Series, which is a new model of doing a small panel for everyone to participate in. We are so fortunate that today we have Josh Lerner of Harvard University and Emily cox Ponky of the University of Washington to kick off this series. The way this will work today is Josh will start with a short presentation on some of his research and topics of interest in bringing invention to impact. Emily will follow. And then after that, we'll have a moderated discussion. You can use your Q&A function to send questions in and I will be very happy to field them. I hope that uh, we all have a chance to learn from Josh and Emily about ways that public and private funding sources work together to support the startup ecosystem. Here at NSF in the IIP division, we have a number of activities focused on that front and focused on technology translation. And we're always interested in bringing in the best lessons from our academic colleagues as well as from practitioners. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Josh to start telling us a little bit about his work on this front. That is great. Thank you, Andrea, for the invitation and for the chance to talk about this. Um, I'll run through um, probably what will qualify as too much material in too short a period of time. But what I will do is, if it's permissible and helpful, I'd be glad to send a few papers for posting on the uh, NSF internet for those who want to follow in on any of these uh, issues. And there's plenty more to, uh, uh, plenty more to look at here. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a topic which has been one of great interest to myself over, over many years, um, which is the topic of government and its relationship to the private venture, its forays into promoting entrepreneurial finance, and its uh, experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly in this regard. Uh, this will draw on a bunch of academic research, um, as well as some more applied stuff. And... Um, Basically, there is, um, for those who want more of me talking about it, there's plenty more where it comes from. As I said, I'll post a few things. All right, so by way of background, we know that venture capital has become, you know, has really emerged as what might be regarded as the sort of dominant form of uh, uh, financing for fast growing, uh, uh, for fast growing firms. Uh, you know, in particular, it's it, as the venture guys are, fond of pointing out more than money in the sense that packages mentorship and uh, credentialing and relationships and so forth. And one way to sort of see this is to look at companies going public in the last 25 years or so in the US, you know, essentially a little under half of them are venture backed. But if you, for instance, look at the total R&D expenditure by, com by these set of companies, by all the recently public companies, essentially almost 90% of the R&D spending is by this subset of venture-backed firms. So it's clearly significant. You know, another way to look at it is obviously to look at just simply the biggest companies in the world. And again, they're, you know, seven of uh, 10 largest are um, R&D are, are venture-backed, uh, you know, five in the U.S. and two in China, the usual, uh, the usual suspects. Um, again, uh, you know, we know that venture-backed companies are particularly innovative, but you know, when you look at measures like we are fond of using in the economics of innovation of patents and citations and citations, you know, subsequent citations or citations to uh, academic science or the breadth of what's there, you know, again, you know, one sees this sort of huge effect where the venture back pa patents when compared to corporate, you know, traditional corporate patents are, uh, are, are much, much larger. Now, this might all sound great, and you say, why is there a need for uh, uh, public policy, though, if we've got this uh, fabulous venture, uh, venture, uh, venture sector? And it really comes down to two issues, one of which is what I call the breath problem, that you know, venture industry does great job in right when we go and look at that list here, who do we see on that list? We see Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, uh, uh, Google, Ali, Tencent, right? It's, it's about, it's largely about software. And why is it about software? Because that's where they've gotten returns. 
They put a lot of money in, in earlier years in clean tech, in advanced materials and so forth, and got very little to, um, uh, very little to show with. And we can see you know, lots of numbers along those lines. Another sort of dimension of this breadth of this aspect is geography, where again, it's quite focused in a relatively small number of geographies. The other thing is that venture is enormously cyclical, that money flows in during hot markets like 1999 and the last few, year, last few years uh, in advance before the COVID crisis. And in other periods, it's extremely hard to uh, come by. And perhaps not surprisingly, what one sees is that during recessions, when he has less VC patenting, you know, the patents that are done are less influential. Now, in general, we know that innovation tends to be pro-cyclical, but it's even more dramatic for uh, this, uh, this um, uh, subset of firms. And even if you look at the very top firms, the top one-tenth or one-hundredth of one percent, one sees that same, uh, same pattern where it's on, on steroids. So that might suggest that there are, you know, the sort of classic kind of market failures, which open the window for public interventions. The challenge here, in some sense, is that this is, you know, a, a tricky arena, right? You can say, you know, there are arenas where, you know, for instance, like, uh, you know, small business in general, where you say everyone sort of is muddling along. So a program like uh, payroll protection plan might make sense because you're just sort of helping everyone a little bit proportional to their employment and so forth. But we know when it comes to venture back companies, you know, the considerable majority of them fail. And really the bulk of returns are driven by a very small handful of companies that are really, really successful. Um, and in particular in that setting, designing you know, effective public interventions can be challenging. There's lots of potential for the kind of problems that we like to refer to as, you know, moral hazard and adverse selection that we can talk about at length in the question period. So I'll talk very briefly about a couple areas where I and others have done some work. Uh, first, I'll just talk for a few minutes about what we see about programs in general around the world. Um, you know, so we've just finished up something which I'll post which essentially looks at every, essentially what we call public entrepreneurial finance program around the world uh, over, the last, uh, over the last 25 years. We found uh, around 750 of these programs, just to sort of ask the question of where they were, pretty evenly distributed uh, around the globe in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, numbers of programs, and this is just at national level. We're not looking at uh, uh, state or, um, or provincial or city programs, but just sort of national programs largely because it was just easier getting a fix around it. If you look at the sort of budgets and sort of look at the average budgets, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of the most active places are the big places like the US, China, you know, Canada, you know, France, Germany, UK, and so forth in terms of the most expenditures, perhaps a more reasonable way to look at it is as programs as a share of GDP, where you got a sort of more diverse kind of picture and you see, you know, certainly, you know, Canada and Finland and um, uh, as well as, um, you know, places like Kazakhstan rising to the rising to the top. Now we do a bunch of stuff to look at uh, to do to look at who does these programs and how does it relate to the presence of private financing. And I'll just talk about a few very quickly, a few of the findings. I won't actually sort of page through the reg regressions per se, but essentially what we find is that um, by and large, um, the programs tend to spring up in places where the venture market is already active. That, you know, certainly the places where there's less private activity have less subsequent government activity, it's also the case that um, in many senses, the better, in better run countries, you know, on various measures of quality of government, this relationship between private and public activities is stronger. That essentially it seems that the, uh, you know, that one of the characteristics is that these things seem to spring up where the private markets are, are already active. Moreover, many of these programs essentially explicitly use relationships 
with the private market, such as you know, essentially requiring matching funds and other provisions. Again, this is sort of most common in places with better run governments and areas where you might think there's more information problems like programs fa focusing on the early stages. And finally, when you look at measures that we might want to look at as sort of long-term measures like, you know, measures of innovation like patenting and, you know, startup activity and so forth, it does seem that when you look over the long haul, the presence of these public programs, you know, seem to actually add fuel to the fire and to actually lead towards more private sector innovation and entrepreneurship. So certainly one thing that came out of this, you know, more global level study was a sense that there's a lot of complementarities between private and public uh, sector in, in this arena, which is sort of very consistent with the uh, uh, thesis that Andrea started us, uh, started us with. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that the devil's in the details and that in particular, being effective here is not just simply being in a place where there is private sector activity and somehow complementing it, but there's a lot of details in terms of program, uh, program design. And I'll illustrate this by looking at one program, which is you know, in many senses, largest US program, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which many of you know well. Um, SBIR is a successful program, and we can see this in uh, a variety of a variety of views. Certainly, this is uh, this is one of them. If you look at the um, uh, uh, Phase One awards and look at this is essentially from some work that Sabrina Howell did, where she essentially looked at firms at DOE that came up for awards and where they had a very strict kind of ranking scheme. People didn't know, you know, you know. It's usual there's a sort of process that were ranked by the individual program managers, and then basically the cutoff was determined later. Uh, you know, and what one saw is that there was a before, you know, it didn't seem the companies were that different in terms of on the left. This is essentially, um, um, but when you looked at afterwards at what happened in terms of the likelihood of firms getting venture funding, for instance the presence of an SBIR award made a huge difference. And if you think about it, the rankings of the firm that's minus one and plus one are very similar, right? It's just one ended up falling above the cutoff and one ended up falling below the cutoff. But you, the ones who got the award were on this trajectory where they got venture money, their revenues increased much more dramatically, their patenting increased very, very dramatically. The program really seemed to make the difference. At the same time, there are two issues with this program that I think uh, she and certainly other observers, including myself, would highlight as sort of real problems. One of them is what we can term the, the SBIR mill problem, that there's a small number of awardees that really from the very beginning of the program seem to have accounted for a, a disproportionate share of the awards. And there is uh, you know, essentially uh, a negative relationship between the number of awards you get and um, you know, and growth, commercialization, uh, um, you know, even, you know, uh, metrics that might be more closely related to use of government, uh, uh, government things. That in a lot of cases, it seems that the mills have tended to use these things as bridges to other awards rather than to uh, commercial, uh, commercial, commercial activity. The second thing is that while, as Sabrina's work here shows, there's this huge positive effect in terms of phase one awards, when it comes to phase two awards, she couldn't find any evidence of a positive effect. Doing the same kind of discontinuity analysis, it seems that the people who are just above or just below the cutoff or didn't apply for phase two awards did as well or even better than the ones who did or who actually got the awards. And yet, when you look at where the money is going, 80% of the money ends up going to the, uh, to the um, uh, phase two rather than to phase, uh, phase one. There's any number of reasons why we might think that might be. You know, one might be you know, there's delays between phase one and phase two that you know, if you've got something hot, you're not waiting around for 18 months, but you go and raise money from other places. You know, we know that there's been a lot of, I mean, certainly the way we teach our MBAs is to always emphasize you've got to reinvent yourself and pivot. You know, so 
is really pivoting and you know being able to sort of respond to customer feedback really consistent with the idea of sort of sticking with the same approach. We can talk about some of the rules later on and so forth. Now, a lot of this stuff is not terribly new. Um, certainly, you know, even back in the uh, uh, 1980s, some of the problems, for instance, with SBIR mills were pretty apparent. Uh, but there's been, you know, essentially the structure of the SBIR program has largely remained the same, even though I would argue that here's a case where you have basically a good program that could become a great program with, you know, relatively modest number of changes. And if you were to sort of try to say, where does the problem really lie? I guess the biggest issue would be probably a very familiar Washington kind of issue, right? Which is that if you think about things from the perspective of a, a awardee who gets one phase one award, goes out and gets some angel or venture money, and then is off to the races and never engages with the program again, they may have benefited tremendously from the program, but they're not gonna be devoting a lot of time to trying to uh, you know, lobby to change program rules and the like. Well, when it comes to the, you know, the, the, the mills and some of the repeat uh, engagers in it, they obviously have much more at stake here. All right, so 15 minutes is come and gone. Thank you for your attention. I'll look forward to any questions after we hear from Emily. And Josh, I appreciate, first of all, I recognize that, that you went very quickly through many of the regression tables. And of course, you'll make those data and analyses available to people later who want to go through them. But we're here to have our wireside chat, which is really focused on big ideas and the lessons that we draw from the data. So thank you for that great introduction to how to think about government programs and, and what is the partnership between the public sector and the private sector in supporting innovation. I think you've given us a lot to think about. We'll turn this over now to Emily, who has a different view of the partnerships between public and private funding sources and how they support innovation. Emily, would you like to begin? Yes, uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Andrea and her team so much for this invitation. Um, as you will see, my work has really drawn on and been inspired by Josh Lerner's work, so it's also a huge honor to be um, presenting on the same panel as you. And I want to acknowledge that the research I'm presenting today um, is going to be zooming in in many ways from what you just saw presented. So we're going to leave um, the comparison of multiple economies um, and we're going to be looking at one really sort of a specific question in a specific industry. And I want to acknowledge that uh, this is work that has been published and is co-authored with uh, Rita Katila and Kathy Eisenhart at Stanford University. And I'm happy obviously to share um, this publication and um, anything else that would be of interest to anyone afterwards. Um, and so to begin, I'd like to paint the picture of what it was like for me as a young, um, freshly minted MBA to move to Palo Alto in 2000. This was the question that uh, came up all the time talking to people is, who should I take funding from? Um, and it wasn't just a question of which VC they should take funding from. Um, when I was talking to my friends who were starting or working in a variety of different industries, it was really, should they be going after government funding? Which corporations should they partner with? Um, which venture capitalists seem to be the most useful? And this is a question that really stuck with me as I um, went into an, uh, a PhD program a few years later. And I don't want to rehash too much of what uh, Josh just said because I, he has literally written the books on it. So I think we can uh, acknowledge what he said. I want to just kind of frame a little bit where uh, this study, the focus came from. And that there was um, a decent amount, as I started looking at this in information about different types of funding relationships and their impact on different firms. And so there is significant evidence that venture capital funding improves sales, growth, survival, and exit for firms. Um, we know that corporations, which I'm gonna be calling CVCs or corporate venture capitalists can provide complementary assets that increase firm value and increase their chances of acquisition. Um, and then there's um, a, an interesting body of research that's uh, definitely been growing in recent years, looking at how uh, government funding of different kinds might aid uh, scientific exploration. And as I looked at this um, body of research, some, a few things stood out to me. I guess at a high level, one was that much of the evidence was really at an aggregate level. So it wasn't really about specific relationships. Um, there was a heavy focus on venture capitalists um, and perhaps less focus on how funding might look like um, in an ecosystem, right? So how different types of funding might work together 
um, within a single firm to help, or within a single industry to help or harm um, innovation. And in particular, I was interested in this question of do investors and funding agencies pick winners or do they help make them uh, after funding? And so the research question we took on was how do funding relationships influence young firm innovation? And I chose to study this in one very carefully defined industry. So it's a segment of the medical device industry that's known, known as minimally invasive surgical devices or MIS devices. And here um, I chose an industry where funding is important. So to get a device uh, through the FDA clearance process typically takes anywhere from 30 to $120 million to do it. So funding is needed. Um, but funding comes from a variety of sources, um, including a variety of government funding um, programs, VCs, um, corporate venture capitalists. Um, and one thing that's interesting about this industry is because the resource needs are sort of in between what you would need to make an app and what you would need to make a, a drug, for example, there's a lot of discretion over when that money is taken. It's often not taken in year one, two, or even three. Sometimes it's pushed to year four. Um, and that becomes important when we think about the impact of different kinds of funding. Another reason why I thought this, in, uh, this industry was interesting, given my interest in innovation, is that innovation in these kinds of devices is hugely impactful in terms of benefits to patients, um, to medical costs um, for society, and to the economic benefits that these firms um, provide. So many medical device firms in this sector get really large, they have IPOs, um, they're acquired for significant amounts of money. And then the advantage of focusing in a single industry is I could control for the technological complexity. So you can see um, an illustration of a medical device here. And you know, these um, are small devices that go in through very small incisions and they're very complex. So they often have, um, well, they not often, they almost always have multiple patents underlying them, um, ranging on things from the uh, visualization to the maneuverability of these devices. Um, this industry is something you probably each are familiar with. If you or someone you know has had a knee surgery or heart surgery in the last few years, you probably ended up with a scar of an inch or two at most. Um, and yet it's something that isn't really defined in our industrial classification codes. So I um, spent a great deal of time um, using MeSH keywords um, to identify any word associated with this industry, um, talking to industry experts and medical histories to identify every single firm that attempted to develop one of these devices um, in the US, whether or not it was successful. So uh, ultimately, I um, identified all firms, whether or not they ever patented, whether or not they received any kind of funding, whether or not they had FDA clearance, they went out of business, if they were successful. Um, ultimately, the population for the study is um, a complete population of US startups in the sector founded between 86 and 2006. Um, and one thing I'll note, because it becomes important later, is that in addition to the quantitative data, which is the results I'll be presenting, um, uh, there's a great deal of field work. Um, so many years of talking to a variety of people in this industry to understand how they thought about these funding relationships, how they thought about innovation, how they thought about resources more broadly. Um, it's also interesting, I think, to note, to sort of think about the variety of ways that we can think about innovation in this industry and as well as about funding partners. So um, of these 198 firms, um, there was over 2,600 patents um, that they filed and over 931 devices, so individual products that received FDA clearance. Um, and if you look at the funding partners, there was over 563 different funding sources. Um, firms in the sample, about 70% of them had funding from VCs, 36 investment by CVCs, about 8% had government funding, and then about 22% of the firms didn't receive any kind of funding at all. And what I'm really interested in this study is looking at um, how funding impacts the ability of these firms to patent and to get products to market with the FDA clearances. Um, and um, I won't spend too much time here, but in order to look at this, very similar to what Sabrina Hall did um, subsequently, I used differences in difference approach where we could match firms um, so based on observable things ranging from their founding year, where they were at, their patents prior to funding, including things like the founding team and the quality of their inventions, and then put together a bunch of groups to analyze. So looking at firms in this industry that were venture backed by VCs versus those that were not, those that had corporate funding versus those that were not, um, looking at different types of government funding and different status of investors. And I will also spare you from regression tables, although I would of course love to show this to you offline. Um, 
But um, let me show you sort of the high level results and then I want to spend the rest of my time kind of explaining what we think is going on here. So the first brush, um, I think what's really interesting here is that, and I wanna highlight this, if you see these plus signs in the, in the third column here, what this is suggesting is that VCs, CBCs, and government agencies all select the same type of firms to fund. Um, it's not that VCs have some magic ability to identify promising firms. Um, but what changes over time is their ability to sort of promote different kinds of invention and innovation. And so you'll see here that none of these types of funding seem to have uh, changed the trajectory for patenting after funding. Um, and only VCs have any impact on um, the ability of a firm to get through the FDA clearance process subsequent to funding. There's no impact from these other funding sources. Um, one nuance that might be interesting is that there's sort of a slightly different relationship um, between high status VCs. Um, they seem to want to continue to encourage firms to patent, um, but don't have a differential impact relative to other venture capitalists on products um, coming to market. Um, this is largely in line with what uh, much of the research that Josh um, presented, but let me suggest a few things that came out in the study that might add some nuance and be interesting for discussion. Um, and I think I'll just sum it up this way. Um, this is something that's been said before, but financial resources aren't enough to promote innovation in small firms. Um, in fact, what's needed are non-financial resources that are provided in a tailored and timely way. Um, so if we think about venture capitalists, this is what we see time and time again um, in our results and all the different cuts we took at them, as well as in all of our field work, which is they really are able to uh, work with an individual firm and provide the resources they need when they need them. And this really uh, fits with the VC's own power and authority and the way that they structure milestones, the way that they help with hiring and provide advice. And I thought um, this illustrative quote from a, a partner at a very prominent VC firm, and when I was talking to him about um, uh, gathering some background for the study, he said, I don't think there's any substitute for being uh, able to go over and visit the companies face to face. Being involved means that you are continuously available to answer questions. The firm knows that they can call me about almost anything. And if I don't know it, if I don't know the answer, I can go say, go call so-and-so and tell them that you're working with me. Um, he also had some interesting stories about, um, you know, answering emails late at night. An, an entrepreneur would reach out and, you know, he, within 24 hours, he would have five answers for him. Um, in contrast, right, the, the corporate venture capital funding, I think, is continually surprising, given that we know that large corporations have the manufacturing and the distribution capabilities. Um, and as we've seen with some of the COVID vaccine races, just the large bench strength that you would think would really be beneficial to firms they found, that they fund. But uh, what we um, suggest is that their dispersed authority, their complex and slow organizational processes, and the internal conflicts there actually really make it difficult for firms that take funding from these large companies to actually get access to these additional resources. Um, so a couple of different quotes, these are from three different entrepreneurs we talked to who worked with strategic partners. Um, one put it this way when describing sort of the pain of getting CBC funding. He said, they're slow as molasses. Resources need to get approved. Technical decisions involve modifications and contracts. They can't get anything done. In their hierarchy, it's just a pain. Um, and then this last quote I thought was interesting too. Um, a, a, another entrepreneur, a founder of a, one of these firms said, the corporate engineers, all they wanna do is to get into fights about technology because they feel threatened. What they haven't done isn't good enough, that kind of thing. Um, and then the government funding was interesting. So we looked at both um, SBIR um, grants as well as some research funding. And we did some cuts between um, NIH and as well as NSF, although very few of these firms received um, NSF funding. Um, as Josh has mentioned, there is a substantial time lag between the application, the funding decision, and the receipt of funding. And that really seems to be impeding innovation in small firms that are trying to move fast. Another thing um, that our uh, results um, highlight is that, um, that there seems to be a, a gap between program officers and entrepreneurs. So program officers typically have scientific credentials, but don't always have business experience. And then the one-size-fits-all approach of many of the SBIR programs ensures broad access, but resources are not tailored nor timed to address individual firm needs. And so um, as one SBIR administrator um, 
told me, we require every grantee to attend a two-day workshop out here. We'll have people from accounting come in and tell them about the importance of keeping good books. We have a software program called Turbo Negotiator they use to help with issues. These are both really valuable things, but firms may be a header behind of when they need those things. And coming out for a two-day workshop may not actually fit with the milestones they're trying to um, achieve. As an entrepreneur who received um, funding from an SBR um, from NIH told me, you can look at the review committee and there's not a single clinician on there. Milestones and the projects are not quite the same. You have to frame things in your application in a way that looks a little more like basic science for them to get excited about what we're doing. And then morph that into product development and hopefully have enough flexibility and have the funds ready to do what we need to do. Right? So, I think what's interesting um, about our quantitative results, obviously, and what these quotes hopefully help sort of um, bring out in, in your minds, is that there is opportunity, um, as Josh has said, for these programs um, to work together in better ways. And I have a few sort of future questions, um, maybe teeing up some research I'm working on, as well as hopefully some of our discussion. Um, I want to acknowledge this was a single industry study. So, there's obviously uh, a lot of differences in the dependence on patenting, for example. Patents are really important in medical devices, less so in other industries. Um, the resource needs, the commercialization trajectory is different in other industries. Our results about government funding are something that have puzzled me for a long time. Um, and I've come to the, uh, sort of think of it as, are our results a bad thing? Is it maybe perhaps a good thing if government funding helps some firms fail faster? Right? Is there perhaps value added by uh, having firms take government funding and then sort of stop there, uh, maybe realizing and recognizing that the project, the team, the company, the device isn't something that is worth investing in the future? And then one thing um, that uh, I hope to be able to get into a bit more, I'm currently on a, a National Academies um, Committee to evaluate the SBIR program for the NIH, and we're just finalizing our data um, access with them hopefully in the next week or two so I can start digging into these um, data. But you know how can these SBIR programs compensate for known problems with venture capital? So uh, Josh highlighted some of these but we know there's a diversity problem in venture capital both in terms of the people who are venture capitalists as well as the people they fund. Um, there's gender issues, there's geographic issues and then I think um, uh, Josh also highlighted this but VCs have an impatience with deep innovation, and that is uh, in line with their own interests and what returns they're making on investments. But if we want to have bigger, deeper uh, kinds of innovation that move beyond apps and move beyond software, which certainly are valuable and have improved each of our lives, um, then maybe these programs are ways that um, can continue to seed those and improve outcomes for all, all of us. Stop there. Um, and of course, happy to answer any questions um, during our discussion, as well as um, offline later. So thank you. That is fantastic. So what I'd like to do then is start to facilitate a discussion among the three of us. And I see that we have a number of people who are starting to send in some questions. And so maybe what we can do actually is start with questions around patents actually. Both of you brought up patents as meaningful outcomes and meaningful components of the ecosystem. Of course, that also, the, the role of patents varies across industries. And so maybe um, I'll start with Emily and then Josh, if you want to comment a little bit on your observations regarding, uh, is, is that an, a measure that is growing in importance? How should government be thinking about the role of patents as we look at supporting innovation? What about the differences between how patents are viewed, for instance, in data sciences versus in engineering topics and in life sciences? So Emily, I'd like to start with you. How would you think about patents given the role that they play in the industry that you studied? Yeah, I mean, it's a super interesting question, right? In, in medical devices, they're hugely important. So I think there's work by Stu Graham and Wes Cohen show that in terms of IP, medical devices are sort of like at the extreme of relying on patents to protect it, right? So this is certainly a way for inventors and companies to protect their inventions. Um, at the same time, they don't actually patent entire devices typically, so it's underlying. Um, it's so different, right, in other industries. So when you talk to people um, in IT, when you talk to people who are working on apps, like patents are used in very different and less ways. And so 
I think that um, that's really a question when we think about innovation, right? Patents are easy to measure um, because the U.S. Patent uh, Office has done a fantastic job making them accessible. And so I think it's one of the reasons we study it so heavily. Um, but I also think that it's an incomplete picture and that there's other ways of getting it in innovation um, and that those need to continue to be considered as we um, study these questions. So, Josh, how would you add to that? Well, I certainly agree with everything Emily had to say. I mean, there is, I mean, clearly patenting has become something that is much more widely practiced in, uh, you know, information technology more generally over the last couple of decades with the rise of, uh, you know, particularly standard setting and just, you know, the, the pool, various kinds of pooling and so forth. But, um, you know, certainly, um, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, getting a great patent does not translate into necessarily raising a bunch of venture capital. It doesn't necessarily translate into doing a, building a great company. It's clearly one tool of a quiver of stuff that, you know, a quiver of, uh, of arrows that one, uh, that firms, that entrepreneurs often use. But certainly um, it has grown in importance for sure over the last 40 years. There's a lot of evidence to that effect that the valuations are tied to intellectual property in general. And I guess it is worth commenting, uh, you know, that the patent system isn't always set up in a way that favors, um, you know, small, high growth entrepreneurs, right? That in a lot of ways, uh, it seems that it's either been, uh, you know, the, the people who have been most vociferous in terms of pushing their, uh, their views of what the patent system ought to do tends to seem to be either uh, big pharma or else the, um, uh, you know, the, the patent litigators and trolls, uh, neither of whom are necessarily, you know, uh, maximizing, uh, uh, you know, have some function of American innovative competitiveness to maximize. So let's extend the discussion on patents to the discussion of deep technology or tough tech. Um, it's known by many different terms, science-based ventures, but really ventures that rely on these critical technologies. And certainly the data also show that the venture capital has really migrated away from that towards software, although there certainly is plenty of venture investment in healthcare, there's not as much, for instance, in the technologies that you discussed, Josh, in the DOE study. Right. So... How should we think about that, both we in government, we as a nation? How should we think about venture capital not being as interested or attracted to those technologies? Um, it's a great question. I mean, you know, there's a reason why the venture guys have sort of drifted away from areas like advanced materials and clean tech, which is that the returns haven't been there, right? So uh, Susan Woodward he has a firm called uh, Sandhill Econometrics where she tries to break down the returns by individual investment. And you know, the, the differences between returns, particularly in the, um, you know, the, the software and communications area and everything else, but particularly with everything else outside of biotech is very stark, right? That you know, essentially, you know, I think clean tech you know, even before fees and stuff like that, she estimates over the last um, uh, 30 years having a return around one or 2%, right? So, you know, essentially no one's making any money there. Um, on the other hand, you know, from a social perspective, this may be stuff that, you know, we really find very valuable, right? That there's all these problems associated with, um, you know, global warming and so forth that we would, that these companies should be able to potentially uh, you know, potentially address. And, you know, in theory, you know, this is exactly the kind of market failure where public intervention can make sense. It's just, it's got to be done right. I mean, I think that, you know, you can think back to the, uh, you know, the intervention that was done as part of the um, uh, stimulus bill at the beginning of the Obama administration, where they basically ended up, you know, selecting a few companies and giving, you know, billion dollar checks to them, you know, most notoriously Solyndra. And I think you can sort of point out a, you know, a number of things in the execution of that, 
that made it far less effective than it could have been had they done some different, different approaches to thinking about how to hand out the money. I mean, I totally agree. And, and I think, right, this is sort of a pervasive problem right now, this appetite uh, for investing in things that you can't see the return from or you can't drive that like connection, right? If it takes 10, 20, 30 years for something to develop, then you see public companies also having less patience for these kinds of investments, right? Because they have their quarterly returns. And so, I mean, this is where I think government has the opportunity, right? To sort of have, and it's become more difficult, I think, um, as we switch different, um, you know, back and forth between different um, leadership and Congress, back and forth, right? How do you have the appetite to sustain programs where you can't see uh, the impact for a decade or two decades and where you can't see the returns as a private investor? And I don't have a good answer. I think that that's sort of something that is a natural result of our, um, you know, our, our metrics driven um, approach to everything. Right. I mean, I think that, you know, just to build on Emily's point that, you know, this is an area where, um, you know, large dem democracies really struggle, right? Because you're going to have a two year or four year, or six year cycle, which makes, and you're doing investments for, you know, 20 year, you know, even the best case, your successor's successor will, will reap the fruits from the decisions that you make. And, you know, in that kind of setting, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. And it seems the places which have really executed on it have either been, you know, very, you know, you, you look at many of the successes in places like Israel or New Zealand, where, you know, it's small enough that the people can really get around the conference table. And as much as there may be political differences, they can sort of set them aside to say, let's think about, you know, not what makes the other guy look bad, but what really is in the long run, uh, run one benefit for the, for the, for the, for the country. It's interesting to frame it that way. You've really identified three different time scales that don't synchronize. One is, and particularly with the example of corporate venture capital, if you're intending to deliver returns on a quarterly time scale, that's one thing. The second is the natural time scale in which an active democracy is refreshing its direction. And then the third time scale is the time scale to exit for a deep technology company. And certainly if the time scale is quite long, which is, um, has been reported in other sources like university spinoff data, et cetera, if you're waiting 10 years for an exit and then your returns are on the order of one or 2%, that is certainly a challenging investment environment. To say and you that. might say that even longer is really building up the kind of ecosystem that Emily was talking about, right? Where you need to get, you know, probably several generations of entrepreneurs that may be a 20 or 30 year uh, uh, process, right? And few governments are gonna have a patience to do it, uh, not to talk too long, but you know, it's, it's fascinating. The Small Business Investment Company program was set up in 58 and you go and look at the hearings of that program in, you know, 65, 66, they were extremely critical saying, look, this company failed and this company failed and so forth. And a lot of the real benefits in terms of, uh, you know, the law firms and you know, early venture firms and so forth in Silicon Valley weren't really evident until the late 70s. So it again sort of highlights not just simply the, uh, the miss, the, 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 those three timeframes, but this sort of super long timeframe of ecosystem building. Another element of ecosystem building, of course, is diversity in all its different forms. You alluded to both geographic and demographic diversity. Josh, you have such a nice telescopic view of the industries through your, um, through your extended work. What is your current perspective on how the private sector views those kinds of issues? What is the role of government in addressing them? Well, that's a whole set of issues here, right? So, you know, there clearly this word packed in the word diversity is a lot of different aspects to it. I mean, certainly one of them is the geographic issue that both Emily and I talked about. And that's a tough one, right? Because in some sense, it certainly seems that 
you know, some of the early stuff that I did on the SBIR program, for instance, suggests that the, if you look not at financial returns, but just simply at jobs created, the SBIR grants that went to, Cal, you know, zip codes where venture capitalists were there already were much more effective than the ones which went to other places. I have mentioned that finding in testimony before Congress, and that's generally not been greeted with open with joy by senators from places like Wyoming. Uh, but, you know, that's one of the sort of, you know, it may well be that you say, maybe there's a need for tailoring the programs to have a different mix of attributes in different places, but it does suggest some of the, you know, the challenges that I think precisely because of the complementarity we were, we've all three of us have talked about, it can make it challenging to um, spread it out, right? I mean, in a way, the, you know, when you look at many of the European Union programs that have been less successful, you know, what they do is they, they start by taking a big pot of money, cutting it into 28 separate pieces, and then each of the countries goes and you know, divvies it out for each province. And what you started off with a huge lump of butter ends up being spread, you know, microscopically thin across all of Europe in a way that really doesn't generate a lot of returns. Yeah, so I mean, the diversity thing is a diverse answer, right? And so mm -hmm. yes to all of that. I mean, there, there's just so many different things. I think that, you know, once again, the money is not enough, right? So giving a grant to someone that doesn't have the opportunity to hire the people they need to scale, right? So, you know, one of the reasons that these grants are super effective in Silicon Valley and in Boston is because there's that whole ecosystem of other supports there. Um, at the same time, I do think that in terms of government funding, right, I, I, I think I saw a comment here in the chat. I don't think that diversity is a scoring criteria, as I understand it, at least in agencies I'm most familiar with. Um, but there's some interesting work by some um, professors at the University of Washington, I think in public policy, right, that just having... Um, a woman on a panel, she's less likely to score uh, female applicants high, but just having that person on the panel tends to alter the scores of the rest of the panel in a way that increases diverse funding, which is interesting, right? So there's some really sort of interesting new studies that are coming out that suggest that, I mean, it's a phrase you've all heard, representation matters, but thinking sort of about the funding here. I also think that, you know, and I'm sure Josh, you know, you've seen this too, but VCs these days are aware of this problem, right? And they're also trying to uh, do a better job at funding people who don't look like them, who aren't you know, necessarily right near them. They will try to get you to move close to them if they do fund you, right? But, you know, so I think that the increased sort of public dialogue about the value of a diversity of ideas and the ideas that are being missed, the companies that could be big but are not being funded, um, I think that sort of public discourse is sort of increasing awareness in I think action on a lot of different fronts is going to help with some of these issues. I mean, that being said, you know, clearly the track record, you know, if we sort of broaden our discussion of diversity from beyond geography to, uh, you know, gender and ethnicity, the venture area has not been, um, you know, a, a wonderful picture by any means. We've done, you know, uh, a bunch of work with the Knight Foundation looking at uh, diversity of asset managers, you know, looking at who actually owns the firm. And, you know, venture, particularly when you look at, you know, both female and historically disadvantaged minorities, you know, all of asset management is terrible, but venture is really down there at the, uh, at the bottom, one, particularly once you exclude, um, you know, Asia, AIP, AAPI, you know, the A Asian and Pacific Islanders. Um, so this is, this is a huge issue and, you know, we might think it's disturbing for a variety of reasons, you know, one of which is that we know that, um, you know, asset management, owning asset management firms has been a path for, to create wealth and, you know, certainly one of the big concerns is the unequal distribution of wealth in the United States. The other thing is the phenomenon that the sociologists like to call homophily, right, that people will end up funding people are they more likely to fund people like themselves, which, you know, has been sort of backed in a number of studies uh, that have been looked at you know, more with a gender focus, but 
Um, you know, so it suggests that not only is it disturbing that the venture industry is so much of a white man's business, but that also that he has knock on effects as to who can get access to capital. Now, you know, how one remedies that and, you know, we've seen a number of examples of in recent months leading, you know, endowments and others voicing opinions that, you know, putting pressure on their funds to try to broaden the pool of people that they hire and with the hope that that'll create a pipeline of people who will go out and do their own firms. But, you know, whether that, that may end up being more effective than direct government intervention, but I think that's a area for debate and exploration. It's interesting to consider the entire ecosystem of what is driving the flow of capital. I mean, you, by talking about the asset managers, et cetera, that really expands the world of players and actors who, who can influence this. And of course, at, at NSF in general, broader impacts is an important and critical criterion for our evaluation of proposals. And we have a number of programs focused on that. SBIR and STTR, of course, include diversity as part of their objectives in the, um, in, in the formulation of the program. I want to open um, a couple more lines of thought. One is that you have the opportunity to have a magic wand and say, here's something that we can think about doing differently as we look at government support of the innovation ecosystem. So Emily, I'm giving you the magic wand. What is something that you think is an important insight that we, either for the government side or for the private sector? Oh man, this is an exciting question and also one I didn't really think about, but I feel like it, you know, the holidays are upon us, so this is a great time to think exactly about Exactly, put your, okay, so. your list, your, you know, put your list and we'll check it twice. Right, exactly. So, I mean, I think here, right, my magic wish as a researcher is one that, you know, to be able to be able to collect the data that really connects early stage things with late stage things, right? And I think this is where we see um, VCs have this sort of advantage and they've got sort of 10 years generally for their fund to mature and exit, right? So they kind of know what's going to happen when and that I think is also really driving their interest in things that can happen fast. But government investment in small firms that are doing things that are longer term, right? It's really hard to track these firms over time. So, you know, I can pull down every SBAR um, grantee from the NSF or the NIH, you know, that's available right now. But then actually figuring out what's happened to those firms over time and mapping out everything, that is just a really data intensive thing. But without those kinds of histories and trajectories across a broad swath of these firms, it really becomes difficult to understand how government funding fits in with venture capital, which fits in with CBC, right? And so this is clearly like the motivation for the study I did. That's one really small sector, right? Um, and so I think that understanding a little bit more about the fit and the impact of these government funding programs um, in a broader time horizon would really provide insights about what could change and how they might change. And in particular, there might be some insights around how to, um, you know, when I've spoken and with people at the NSF and in the NIH, and when I um, have read all the documentation, there's a lot of effort to provide more than just the money but it doesn't seem to necessarily have the same impact. So understanding how to provide those additional resources um, might actually take a lot of the existing efforts, transform them slightly, and then increase their impact. So that would be my wish list and also my sort of hope of an outcome. I like the word trajectory. I think that is so true, right? That they, these, there are so many forces acting on this as it goes through a system. The trajectories are an important thing to understand and probably the most important um, factor or the most important thing we can study. Josh, what's a, what would your magic wand touch? Yeah, I would, I would build on Emily's and also sort of put in some room for experimentation as well, which I know is in Washington hard to do, right? I think there's often a sense of uh, saying, well, if I run this experiment or try this thing differently, if it works, the other guys won't believe it. And if it doesn't work, I'll just be criticized by the other guys. So there's no real incentives for me to, um, uh, to do this, right? But I think that, you know, certainly when you look at, you know, 
many of the places that he have been what I would regard as the most creative in terms of, uh, you know, government policies around entrepreneurial finance, and I put, you know, Singapore and again, Israel probably on that list, they have really had the philosophy of, you know, throwing spaghetti against the wall, right? That, you know, they'll try something, they'll tweak it, they'll get rid of it, they'll try something new, and there's continual change out with, you know, a variety of evaluations and, and studies along the way, but you know, certainly not a, will, a, a real willingness to sort of rock the boat. You know, when we look at the US, you know, the bulk of the money, you know, in this sort of public entrepreneurial finance is really SBIC and SBIR. That's a program, you know, whose basic design, one program was basic design was set in 1958. You know, they tweaked it a little, Karen Mills tweaked it a little bit during when she was SBA administrator, but it largely remains the same. And then SBIR, you know, basically has been the same thing since, you know, basically Roland Tibbetts rolled it out in 1977 at, at NSF, right? And, you know, there's been just very, you know, certainly in terms of the program design, I would argue pretty incremental changes to it, even though the venture industry is, you know, hundreds of times larger than it is today. So I think that need for, you know, really running experiments, you know, sort of seeing how to, how to change things, how things can be approved. I mean, you know, again, you know, Roland was a brilliant guy and I'm sure whoever set up SBIC in 1958 was brilliant, but, you know, it, it probably wasn't perfect, those designs, and there was probably some room for improvement yet to come. Well, I do want to point out that one of Emily's slides, which had some critiques of um, government funding, certainly at NSF, we've tried to address them. And one of the ones, uh, one of the issues that you raised was the time scale of funding and the time scale of hearing back. That is one reason that we've initiated our project pitch process, mm -hmm. which allows someone to effectively submit the equivalent of an executive summary and hear back pretty rapidly just to hear that if they're an appropriate fit for the program or not. The other one that we're particularly excited about, you spoke about experience in the program officer um, population, but certainly at NSF, we've also recruited from the startup and investment communities extensively. And so we're certainly aware of those kinds of issues and are really committed to making public entrepreneurial finance effective. But I guess my, my observation would be that certainly NSF has been among the most creative and thoughtful there, right? And obviously you have several benefits. And one of them is probably that, you know, it's just my sense is that doing things at DOD are just, it's just simply a lot more complicated for a variety of reasons, you know, not the least of which is they've got to keep us safe as their primary mission. Yeah. Well, and I just, you know, we my study and the implications from it were the majority of that came from NIH uh, funded firms. So take that for what it's worth. Well, every agency has its own mission and its SBIR and STTR programs have to align with the mission of the agency. We're very fortunate at NSF that we can attract from the general startup community. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank you both. I know it's an unusual format to present research findings since we spoke very little about the research methodology, but I think that the bigger issues that you've allowed us to explore have really been very meaningful. And so Emily, I'd like to thank you again and Josh for helping us kick off our Wireside Chat series. And I'd like to thank everyone who chose to listen in. So thank you again. Thank, thank you. you.